Hello, everybody, and welcome to the ABT Time Podcast with this being episode number 43, I believe. And uh, we're going to have a huge amount of fun today. Let me just start off with a couple little updating announcements, things that are going on, and then we'll bring in our guest, Julie Burwald. Um, let's see, you know, the big thing, time to start hyping is we're working on a new um, volume of the Narrative Gym series of short books that we've done. So we put out four of them, and the fifth one is coming October 1st. And I hate to say it's the best of all, but I think it's going to be the best by far. It's it's really going to be the grand synthesis of the ABT framework to date. Um, it's going to be authored by Marlis Douglas, who will be joining us later in our discussion here for a few minutes, um, who's professor at University of Arkansas, and Keisha Barr, professor at uh, Texas A&M, and then myself as the third author. And the title of this volume is going to be The Narrative Gym for Science Graduate Students and Postdocs. And it's very practical. Um, as with the other books, there are seven chapters. And I'll be telling people when this comes out, the way to look at this book is jump to chapter seven, the last chapter, which lists uh, five sections, lists five applications of the ABT. Um, number one, to for doing pitches. Number two, for proposals. Number three, for papers. Number four, for presentations. And number five, for life in general. And it's um, those sections are going to be written by Marlis and Keisha because they've been using the ABT framework for the last two or three years of their graduate students and are hugely enthusiastic about it. So this is going to be um, a nice little shift. They're going to be the lead voice for this version of it, and I'm going to take a back seat on the whole deal. But more importantly, is it, it will be done by October 1st, and it's already available for pre-order on Amazon. Um, I will be encouraging people for the next six weeks to get ready to use it for courses this fall because it's a perfect little manual. It's so short and brief, only be like 75, 80 pages, something like that, but it's just practical on how to apply the ABT framework for shaping the narrative of whatever it is that you're you're communicating. So that's our big news. Also, in two weeks, we'll be starting the fall rounds that we're doing of the ABT framework course. We've got four of them running concurrently, which will be with the World Bank, with Genentech, with uh, Georgia Medical Schools, which is University of Georgia, Georgia Tech, Emory, and Morehouse, and then a split round between NOAA and uh, Federal Aviation uh, administration. So going to be a busy, busy fall as things continue to expand exponentially with the activity on the ABT framework. In fact, in uh, three weeks, I'll be going to Nepal for two weeks to work with the World Bank folks and their Southeast Asian folks and their global sector leaders um, who are going to be jumping in on ABT framework in a big way. So that's all the fun, exciting announcements that we have for now. Um, Time to get going on our discussion here. And how about, Julie, if you want to join me right here from the outset, and I'll do one of my disastrous introductions of a guest in which it's all ramshackle. But uh, Julie and I have known each other for, God, quite a few years, uh, going back to when she was a graduate student at University of Southern California in the biology department. I was in film school there in the mid-90s. She was doing a PhD in biological oceanography, working on optics mathematical models and optics and photosynthesis and the title of your dissertation julie was god no come Don't on come it. on just just Don't paraphrase it. It. yeah paraphrase or give us some idea what what was it on uh it was on the average cosine of the um yeah the the light underwater light field so it was yeah, it was well, a so many people want to know so much more about the average cosine <laughs> of the underwater light field, but we're going to have to postpone that discussion for a future episode um, <laughs> because we're mostly here to talk about your book, Spineless, which is hugely popular and successful with all the rave reviews of it, all that kind of stuff. But uh, let's begin with a little bit of the timeline. And, you know, you've kind of followed a little bit of my type of journey in that you went from science out into the broader arena and then eventually found your voice now with the writing stuff. And you even tell about that at the beginning of the book. Um, and I found some of those parts really compelling and very relatable for me. Um, correct this as I presented, but you basically finished um, there and got married and had some kids, moved to Austin. And I remember when you got involved with an educational content production company, You'd gotten in touch with me about some things back then. 
So you worked with them for a while and you thought that was great, but you just didn't quite find it as fulfilling and gratifying as what you were looking for, which then eventually led you to this creative writing, which, I mean, you're very lucky. You just happen to have a gift for really good writing style. You know, I, I, I love reading the book. And you've just got a voice that is um, instantly charismatic and compelling to the point where you just want to read on and on. You don't really care so much where the whole story is headed to. It's just the style is, is so good. Uh, makes me think of what I always say about HBO Real Sports. With the storytelling is so good on that show that you get to the point where you no longer care what the episodes are about. And you just turn it on like whatever it is. I'm sure they found some really interesting angle to it. And that's the same thing with the content in your book. Just page after page is topics that I wouldn't go looking for a book myself to read about, but you found something interesting and all these different bits and pieces. So let's see. Um, and can you want to fine tune my account there of your basic professional journey? Is that close to the, the is it kind of in three acts there of science, then the educational stage that led you then to the creative writing? Yeah, I think that's pretty much it. I mean, uh, like one little, like, kind of filling in some of the holes on that is that I um, I basically became a math major in college because I was terrified of writing <laughs> and because my roommate um, in college was such an amazing writer I felt like oh my gosh I could never possibly like compete with that so I just like decided to become a math major and that was sort of <laughs> like, <laughs> of course. because I was like oh I could not I mean I love I liked math a lot but I you know I don't think I had any particular like gift at it. Um, oh, wait a second, you must add some gift. I mean, you I must mean, I was been... like, I was okay, but like, I it wasn't like I could break ground in math. You know, oh. I wasn't that kind of person. But but so, you were able to take higher level math courses and not really stress over them, where other people just can't even begin to do the first. I mean, that's me. I took calculus <laughs> and pretty quickly hit the wall. My conceptual capabilities, but that stuff was like easy for you. Well, I mean, not easy, but like I could do it. And yeah. so but it's a funny thing when you show up in grad school for biology, because if you can do any of it, you get pigeonholed in that in that world. And that's kind of what happened with me. And um, and so it so going from that, like, oh, I'm a math person to I know how to write and I know how to use my voice. That was that was really hard. And that was a long process process of practice what, what, what was the first moment that you ever felt anything I mean must have been back in junior high school or something like that you written some essays that that people liked reading or something like that I mean I think in high school I was one of those like well-rounded people who did all of you know who was I was a pleaser kind of person so I like I definitely you know read and did all those things but like and and I've I think always I've been a big huge reader. So I one of you, I've always read and I've read really broadly and I read a lot of fiction and I read a lot of memoir and I actually didn't even when I was going through grad school for science read a lot of popular science. I just it just wasn't my mm -hmm. my gig. I I kind of felt like oh I'm doing science all day. I I want to read stories at night <laughs> or or when it's my own time. And I've always been that way. So so I think what you're reading in my voice is, is this huge influence of fiction and memoir into the, um, the stories of, you know, the science stories that are in my books. Yeah. Because yeah. I like reading those stories and I like reading stories where I want to turn the next page. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted my readers to want to turn the next page also. And I didn't see why I had to write in a very pretentious way or in a way where I like had all the answers um, and still be able to convey good science. Like, All right, wait a second. All right, we're going to get right to the okay. heart of that <laughs> so. pretentiousness here with this one quote that I want to read. That it just, uh oh, just, did I read? Did I write? No, something? no. This this is brilliant writing. Oh. I mean, this is the first thing that caused me to kind of have a little moment of whiplash. Okay. Um, early on, you're talking about uh, Medusa, and I'm going to just read this. Uh, Medusa was born to two ancient marine deities, and according to Ovid, was stunningly gorgeous. She served the goddess Athena in her temple. Some say she was a temptress and lured Poseidon into Athena's temple. Others say Poseidon couldn't control himself. As in too many cases like this, it depends on who's telling the story. Since I am, he raped her right there in Athena's temple. <laughs> I thought that was awesome. 
<laughs> Since this is my version, we're going to go ahead with the rape narrative. Um, well, how it, many times have a, has a man told that story? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. So this is my version. I'm going to exercise my prerogative. Yeah. Um, but now just the style of your writing there, that would just caught me so abruptly. <laughs> Since this is my version. I'm doing it this way. Um, yeah. That's great. That's really creative and really fun. And um, just that you've got that style. Now, here's something really interesting. And, and um to kind of confront you with on this whole thing which is i'm sure you read uh the immortal life of henrietta lax you know long ago uh brilliant book and i have talked about in my books where i've written uh, mentioning that because it's it's so good but the fascinating thing with that is that you can't p- please people all the uh, all the people all the time and what's so fun sometimes with the amazon reviews is to go to the one star reviews and and read all the disgruntled people and sure enough, you can see it right there, which is all the literal minded people are all the one star reviews on that Henrietta Lacks book, which was number one on Amazon for, you know, over a year. Absolutely brilliant book. But there in the one stars are a bunch of grumpy people saying, I hated that she kept talking about her own personal journey. It got in the way of I wanted to know more of the science, blah, blah, blah. All right. The heavily literal minded people like that, you cannot please. Um, and I saw the same thing going to not the one star reviews for your book, but the, the, there's a few two star reviews that are exactly they're straight out of the Henrietta Lacks thing, which is why did she have to tell us about her family? And then you go to all the five star reviews, which they're far more. And the main thing they all say what was so great was the personal element that she brought into it, her own personal narrative and really brought it to life and humanized it, and all these sorts of things. So that's the endless challenge that you face is dealing with the heavily heavily informational literal minded people that you just can't please them with this stuff and you just got to step back and look and realize they're not a very large part of the audience and they're just they're just going to be grumpy no matter what you do um but do you see the parallel with that henrietta lax book and you know they're both brilliant writing and you just that goes with the territory you can't please all the people right yeah no for sure and in fact i mean henrietta lax it's funny because when I when I was deciding to write a book, um, what happened was I had been writing a few articles for National Geographic, and I'd sort of connected up with this um, this photographer named David Lichwager, who's pretty famous. Mm-hmm. And David had asked me to write the text for one of his books, um, this book called One Cubic Foot, which is uh, it's a really cool concept. It's a high concept book. He, he made a one cubic foot out of PVC pipe and stuck it in six different ecosystems around the world. And, um, and, then, and then photographed everything that fell in that cubic foot. And so he and I had been working on a few stories together and he liked my writing and he said, would you write the text for this book? And I was like, oh my gosh, yes. Like I have, you know, I like I said, I'm a huge reader. And so to like be an author suddenly was like, within my grasp. Mm -hmm. And so I, the first, the first uh, chapter was actually the coral reef in Morea in Tahiti. And and what ways was this all happening while you were working at that educational company in Austin? Yeah, I was still working. Well, actually I had gotten laid off from there. There was a huge, the tech butt boom in 2000 Mm -hmm. had, they laid off like half their employees. So I was one of those. Mm -hmm. But what had happened was so many people got laid off and they scattered to all these other educational companies like media companies that I was freelancing then because I had editor friends everywhere. And so I was kind of freelancing and I was occasionally writing these like National Geographic or more like even like some um, press releases for Woods Hole Oceanographic. Like I was doing some more kind of story, little short story work at that point. And so David asked me to write the first, the, the, this chapter on coral reefs. And I was like, oh my gosh, I get to do this. Like, this is great. And I like wrote my heart out and he, I didn't hear back. I didn't hear back. And I had actually been to that coral reef in Morea because in grad school, I had gone on a research cruise that left out of Tahiti. And so after, so I got to Tahiti and then I spent like three weeks there afterwards. And did so you I, spend time, Berkeley used to have a lab there, right? Did you, did yeah, you? I didn't go to the lab. I was just kind of camping around, mm-hmm. but I had dove on that reef. And um, anyway, so I write my heart out and then I don't hear back and I don't hear back. And I'm like, what did I do wrong? And I finally hear, no, we want to have Elizabeth Colbert write this book. <laughs> and I was like. Wow. I was like, <laughs> like, she's more famous than you. And I was like, oh my gosh. Like, 
I was, and, and it felt like, you know, this. That's awkward. a dirty trick. It was Excuse so me. such a bummer. So then I had this like sense of, oh my gosh, I didn't realize how much I wanted to write a book until it got snatched away from me like that, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and so, <laughs> That's terrible. Yeah. But at the same time, it was kind of weird because um, I had been reading books. I had been reading books to like, kind of like get the feel for what an, a popular fiction book was like. Mm -hmm. And I kept putting them on my bookshelf and saying, oh my God, I can never write a book like that. Like, oh my God, I can never write a book like that. And finally it was, and it was, I was kind of at this low point because I'm like, oh my God, this, this David Lichweiger book got pulled away from me. All these books I'm reading that like could be books that I would want to model my, my book after. I just don't feel like I could write those. And then one day I woke up and I was like, oh, I could never write a book like that. And I just changed the inflection. And I'm like, that's because I need to write a book where I have my own voice yeah. that has a more feminine point of view, where yeah. I can tell you my story as I go along, where I want you to turn the page because you want to know what happens next, not just because there's more science on the next page. Mm -hmm. But like that, I had this kind of like light bulb. And then I was like, oh, actually, it was a good thing that I didn't write David Litchweiger's book because I can only write my own book. And yeah. so that was kind of what, um, you know, set the the realization, I think a long time ago, <laughs> a few questions back, you asked me about realization, but so it was kind of slow going. Yeah. But um, those were some of the things that made me get there. Well, there's nothing more powerful than the first person voice. And that's the trade off. And the very first book that I wrote was way back when I was a junior uh, professor. And I wrote a book that was all my stories in the marine biology world. And it was really a ton of fun. And I had three different literary agents represented and it never got published. And I ended up getting these rejection letters basically said, you don't have a Nobel prize and nobody's going to buy your book. Um, this was way back before there was much of any sort of popular science writing. And the only thing, well, Richard Feynman's book was, you know, number one bestseller because he had a Nobel prize, whatever and it's you know, great book. Um, but it, it was the best piece of writing I ever did, but there were a certain number of people that I, I wasn't prepared for this. They read it and like, who are you to think you get to tell your personal story, your autobiography? And that's why I mentioned that thing about the Henry L. Lacks book and just those one star reviews. Those are all these bitter people that come at you when you start talking in the first person. There's there's just some sort of resentment of some small group of people. And then it's the same tool that all the bigger audience enables them to connect with what you have to say because you're embodying the, the interior monologue for all the stuff that you're seeing and, and wanting to comment on. Um, let's see, before we get going too further on the book, um, a couple of characters that I wanted to chit chat with you about and, and you know, I, I just in their honor and, and I do this podcast just for myself. You know, I just have people on that I like and I like to talk to. And it's like uh, going to a coffee shop for an hour and, and just recording it. Um, but you and I both were buddies with Jay Vabra, uh, who was a great graduate student there at USC when I was in film school and we became buddies. I'm, there was that stretch there, Donald Manahan's lab. He he just had an ability to recruit these amazing graduate students. And when I was there, there were six or seven people in that lab that I got to be buddies with. And Jay was one of them. They were all so fun and so interesting as people. A lot of them kind of didn't pursue science as a career. Some of them went off into teaching. Uh, and Jay was one. And Jay was such an interesting guy. His uncle was a horse photographer. He did the the photos for what was that the movie the horse whisperer i think yeah uh, yeah and he did all these photo shoots and he had a ranch in in spain and just uh and i think he had he had met and spent time with ernest hemingway in, in oh yeah. yeah yeah right exactly and i remember jay showing me the copy of death in the afternoon that was autographed by hemingway that was from his uncle and all those sorts of things um and you know when i first moved to la one of the first things i managed to do was i tracked down uh, Tom Steinbeck, John Steinbeck's son, because I was a lifelong fan of, of Log from the Sea of Cortez and, and all of Steinbeck's writings. And through a bizarre set of <laughs> stories and circumstances, Tom and I became best buddies and we worked on a treatment for the Log from the Sea of Cortez. And I ended up in 1996, um, Tom invited me to his wedding in, um, in Pacific Grove. And Jay went with me and we drove up there and we spent three or four really fun days up, up there and went to the wedding. And, and for Jay, it was just mind blowing because he was such a fan of Steinbeck and to, to get to meet his son and all the other characters. Tom was a complete character. That's a whole nother set of stories. But, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, I had so much fun with Jay and he was such an kind of old school guy 
And he would take those camping trips down to Baja and just go fishing and camping and diving for like a week and camping on the beach and all those sorts of things. Um, and eventually he developed cancer and, and passed away, I think probably about seven or eight years ago. Uh, that was so sad. But he also became a great teacher there at, um, was it High Tech High down in, in San Diego? Yeah. And yeah, yeah. And you were, you were a grad student with him. Um, from those years yeah too. yeah Jay and I we took a lot of those trips to Baja together and oh wow tell, tell us about a few of those just I mean well actually one of the the most memorable moments with him was um actually not in Baja it was in California and we had gone um up to San Luis Obispo and um he uh I think it was like he and this other guy Wes who West. was my boyfriend yep. at the time yep. and I, and we'd gone and Jay had this old uh, bus, you know, that he drove <laughs> right. around that he like was, it was constantly breaking down. He was constantly bringing that thing back to life. But you could, we used to joke that you could like live, you could easily li survive an apocalypse in that bus. Like there was, you would be in the middle of nowhere and all of a sudden he would be serving like smoked oysters and, and, and Chablis out of the bus like he would have dug that out of the somewhere in the bus and you're like what are you you're me you know he was just amazing that way but this one trip um I will it was one of the most amazing we were we were they were we were surfing we were supposed to be surfing I wasn't a good surfer but Jay and Wes were and yeah. um on this beach and it was like a cove there wasn't really anyone else there and we were just kind of like sitting on the surfboards I don't think the surf was very good and all of a sudden um these three gray whales we're migrating north and they uh, come into the cove uh, and they they come super close to where we are and just start going. They go down to the bottom of the cove and the three of them dig like they rub their bellies around in the yeah. bottom of the cove on the sand and the to resuspend whatever they could. And then they they created like a whirlpool to to concentrate whatever they dug up off the bottom. And then one by one, they would come up with their mouths like in a oh. open come out of the water and then just like bring their jaws together and the water would spill out over the sides and they would be straining out whatever they had resuspended and and they just they spent they were just speeding and we just sat on our surfboards and watched them and then they sort of had their fill in that cove and they swam away around the point to the next cove. And Jay was like, let's go, let's go. And we, <laughs> we paddle to the next cove north and they just do the same thing. They like, so we spent hours in the water just like uh, watching these three gray whales feed yeah. as they went up the coast. And it was, I've never had an experience like that. And it was um, really, really special. And, and that was like halfway down Baja or where was it? No, no, no. We were up near San Luis Obispo. Oh, oh near San Luis We were in oh California. Yeah, oh, yeah. California. Yeah, it was a crazy, crazy. And there thing. was nobody else around watching this with mm -hmm. you? Oh, no. My goodness. It was crazy. just, it was magical. So, I mean, Jay, Jay, I, he, he. Amazing guy. Yeah. He, he died way too young, way, 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 way too young, but he had yeah. such life you know his experiences and he made all those experiences happen like that's the one thing about jay he just yeah he, he was somewhat of a romantic you know and, and yes, he, he absolutely he was. all right all right on that note i i gotta tell my one jay yeah. Pack story that uh i i think he would be pleased to be telling this <laughs> but it's kind of hilarious um that first couple of years I was in film school, I lived in this amazing apartment that was in Beechwood Canyon in Hollywood. That was right below the Hollywood sign. It was really kind of a fancy little place, little stucco apartment. And um, one time I was headed out of town for the weekend and he just started dating <laughs> this woman. And I told him, you know, if you want to stay, oh, you know what it was? Actually, I forgot about this. He had an aquarium, um, big tank, and he had an eel and a barramundi cod that he needed somebody to take care of it. And so we set it up in my living room, my apartment. And so I had it for like a year and a half and nicknamed the fish and the eel. Um, <laughs> um, and so then I was added out of town and I said, you know, if you want to, you can stay at my place. And he said, oh God, actually I'm, I'm going out on a date with this, this woman and, uh, and we're going to go to Hollywood and it'd be really cool if we could just stay at your place that night. I said, sure, okay. And so I had just been to this, uh, do a Dodgers game and I caught a foul ball. And so I don't know why, but the last thing I did is I left the place for him was I 
took that baseball and put a post-it note on it and said, hit a home run. And I put it on my pillow on my bed. <laughs> and he said that he walked in with this woman and was just walking around, checking out the place. And she was in the living room. He walked in the bedroom, but he saw that thing. Like, oh my God, <laughs> grabbed it and hit it under the pillow or something like that. Hilarious. But yeah, no, he loved that story. He told that to people for years. Um, such a great, great guy. Did you ever see the film that he did about the surfing and the, the buddy of theirs with, with cancer who they took surfing as his last trip? Um, they had a screening of it at the Director's Guild that he took me along on. And I don't know who made the film, but it was right when I was just starting to get into surfing. And it was kind of, you know, ominous in some ways because it was about a guy who was dying of cancer and all of his surf buddies um, sneak in the hospital and sneak him out for one oh, last surf trip down to Baja. Yeah. And they took him down there. It's a really great story. You know, it's just kind of this last hurrah type of thing. Um, and yeah. And then eventually, yeah. oh boy. Um, and so then the other character we got to talk about for a couple of minutes here is uh, Dale Kiefer, your advisor, who's also one, I mean, just that, that biology department there in the it 90s. So kooky. Yes. They had so many interesting characters. In there. You know, it was, I feel like it was like a little bit it, it's gotten fancier, I think. I went back to give a talk after Spineless came out and it felt like more kind of oh, yeah. together. And then definitely it had like a storied past, you know, with um, with Hancock, Hancock, right? And yes, no, yes, yeah, Alan Hancock. Yes. Alan Hancock, right? Who like, yes. you would read stories of, of him and um, yeah. and he like, they would go out on these boats with like a quartet to oh, play yeah. music and stuff. Like they wore, you know, so yes. it had this storied past, but I feel like we were there during this time when it sort of like fell through the cracks or something. <laughs> you know, it was an odd building there because you, you know, actually that's the whole history of it was because he was such a man of the arts that he built that building and it was half biology and half music. Right. And then decades later, everybody stuck like, why do we have to go to the biology department to record music? And, and yeah. <laughs> biologists are like, why do we have these music people in our building? Um <laughs> Which is a shame because you're right. He was a Renaissance man like that, and it did all the. Um, what was the? Was it the Valero? Was that the name of the the research ships that they had there? And that he took all these cruises. You know all about the cruises to Galapagos Islands and the famous story of the Countess who washed up dead. On no. The oh God! When oh I was my gosh! That, yeah. No. Oh, this is this is tremendous. Um, there was a, a German Countess who you know set up camp there on one of the islands in the Galapagos Islands in like the 1930s or so and kind of went cuckoo and eventually on one of the research expeditions they I think it was her body they found washed up and I remember hearing about this in undergraduate Chuck Berkland and in the zoology course I took from him talked about that and he said it's the craziest thing you're reading through the you know these research reports of the cruises of the Valero and all of a sudden you come to this picture of this dead body with a bunch oh my of God. yes and there she is in there um and there's actually a film that was on Netflix a few years ago, a documentary that was a whole bunch of old black and white footage from the 1930s that told that whole story of wow. uh, Cuckoo, but that's more other crazy stories. Um, but yeah, tell us a few words about your advisor, Dale Kiefer. Well, Dale, <laughs> Dale's, you know, he's just one of the most fascinating people I've ever known in my life. And he just, he has, uh, he's hard to he's hard to explain. Like he, he he's brilliant. Um, and he's so like, is open. he a mathematician with his, he's not a mathematician, no. but he likes math a lot. And so okay. that's why he, he, um, he's a biological you know, oceanographer, phytoplankton. He guy. was, yeah, he was a phytoplankton guy. He, he discovered that when phytoplankton do photosynthesis, some of the energy that they take in for photosynthesis actually gets emitted as fluorescence. And so it's a, and it's a quantifiable amount. So you could use fluorescence as a, as a way to say how much photosynthesis was going on. And that was really just an incredible breakthrough because you can see fluorescence and you can't see photosynthesis. So it's pretty cool. And so, yeah, he, he, he just is, he's really, really brilliant. Um, he's one of those people who like, doesn't, He's so open. He like wants everyone else's point of view to be part of what he's yeah. thinking about. And so, and he's, he's, he's just, he sometimes acts like you think he's confused, but he's actually just really thinking really hard yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. and he, and, and things catch his attention and then he's just stuck on them. And he, he wants to think about them really hard. He's one of the, 
I remember we would sit in his office working on like these equations and these models. And we would have been working for like three hours, no breaks. And I would be exhausted. Like my brain was done. And there was no evidence that he was tired at all. Like he was one of these people who can concentrate on something for way longer than human, humanly possible. Um, so anyway, I don't know, Dale. But was, he's, was he at all um, disappointed when you headed out of academia off to, to what you did in Austin with the educational? I don't know about that. I mean, I think he's not really a judgmental person. So yeah. uh, I don't think he. Yeah, he's just happy to see. Yeah, I mean, I think he. Forward. Yeah, no, I don't think he was disappointed. I think he's yeah. kind of thought like you're following your path. He's he's very non judgmental. Yeah, yeah. Now that's great. Um, all right, we got to jump into a few jelly okay. questions here. Um, so starfish. You know, a lot of people wanted to get rid of the word fish, and so they're called sea stars by lots of people. Is there any movement in that on jellyfish and calling them jellies or anything? Yeah, like for sure. A lot of people, most people call them jellies, jellies in, they want to at, get at scientific meetings and stuff. They're mostly jellies. Yeah. They hate the word jellyfish. I don't know about hate. I don't think it was as strong as the sea star movement, but like, <laughs> but I, I definitely do hear je yeah. jellies. Um, you get these people correcting you and you're talking about something like, well, we don't like to call them that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, let's take a minute or two here on the big issue. Um, you know, in 2002, I got going on shifting baselines. And when I had that editorial in the LA Times in November 2002, jellyfish was a major part of the story I picked up from Jeremy Jackson. Basically, he'd just give me tutorials on what shifting baselines meant. And then I was just kind of the communicator that, that wrote that editorial to help get it out there broadly. And yeah. one of the main storylines at that point in time was that the sudden awakening and realization that ecosystems are collapsing around the world in, in marine ecosystems and the possibility that some of these ecosystems are headed towards jellyfish blooms and trophic collapse and all those kinds of things and then you got into that a bit um and i really like that one little passage you, you quoted the uh, guy in 2008 i forgot who it was but warning everybody about let's that that the media world was looking for headlines and we've had it yeah, yeah. The rise of the jellyfish and all that kind of stuff was just one of those directions that everybody wanted to hear that story um what's your bottom line on it right now you mentioned that little survey where it was seven maybes and two yeses and one no <laughs> and then what the guy from dolphin island <laughs> said i don't care or whatever yeah <laughs> that, that, that was awesome um but you know wh what is the fate of um can you draw a beat on is there a worldwide pattern on I think there's a, I think we're seeing an increase. I mean, this guy, Lucas Brads, who's up at UBC, who, who works as, as part of that group, this, the, the um, poly group, he, you know, he did another, another study and, and something like 65% of the coastlines, if you use anecdotal information, so you have to kind of use all the information we have, looks like jellyfish are on the rise. If you, if you, you know, not all of it is really good data because jellyfish don't have good data because the way we collected them was terrible for jellyfish mm -hmm. um, using big nets and stuff for the whole 20th century. So the baseline is never going to be there. But if you use what you've got and you kind of like take a large swath, look at the world. Yeah. Something around 60% of the coastlines are places where jellyfish are increasing. You know, interestingly, I just published a story in Texas Monthly about jellyfish this a uh, couple months ago, and I found some Texas Parks and Wildlife data in, for the Gulf of Mexico, mm -hmm. and there, there what? And you would think in the Gulf of Mexico you would have seen increases in jellyfish numbers because, uh, because we have all these like places for jellyfish polyps to live in terms of like the thousands of of oil platforms that are out there. And this data went back to 1983, and there's no there's no trends at all. So. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So I, you know, so I think that, yeah. yeah very, okay. Let, let's jump topics for a minute here because this is actually a bullseye in your topic. And this is, a, this is an issue that got me very angry a decade ago, which was the paper that came out in nature that said there is a 40% decline in standing crop of phytoplankton worldwide since the 1950s. Did you, you remember that coming out with Boris Worm was the third author yeah. on it? Did yes. you see what Boris Worm just came out with today? Uh-oh. Um, <laughs> I hope it's better than what happened with that, because let, let's hold on to that thought for a okay. moment. Let, let's say a few things about this. 
Um, you don't, it was in nature. It, I, I was dumbfounded by it. It was around 2010 or 11 and a major thing claiming. And, you know, I taught biological oceanography at University of New Hampshire for several years. And if this article, this paper had claimed a 4% worldwide decline, I would have said, wow, that's, that's kind of stunning, but it was 40% and it was in nature and it sat mm -hmm. there for a couple months. And then they had all the rebuttals. And there was about a dozen people that wrote in exactly what you're saying. And I remember there was one group that said, you know, at least for the North Atlantic, there's definitely no significant decline. It may have even increased since the 1950s. We don't, there's so much noise, yada, yada, yada. Exactly. Yes. And that obliterates your faith. You know, there I am trying to make these films defending science and the scientific process. And then you see a gargantuan blunder like that. And then I ended up at this Aspen environmental forum where a guy got up and said, and, and today we've got 40% less phytoplankton. And when he said it, I, I was seated there. And I said, that's wrong. Oh, and that guy got so mad at me and attacked me in the hallway. He said, what are wow. you doing at this meeting? You're an anti-environmentalist. I'm not an anti-environmentalist. That was just noise, nonsense that nature went and published. How can the machinery be so wrong at a scale like that and not pay a price? And, you know, that that, that goes on and on and that sort of stuff. But I'm. Um, it's tough. It, you yeah. know, and I feel like part of the problem is we want to say these like big global. We want big global yes. trends in biology. Yeah. But there's so much noise. Have, there's variation there's so Right. And we may be able to say globally carbon dioxide is going up. Like we can say things in chemistry yeah. that are global. But when we go to biology, you just need more nuance than that. Well, and the whole reason that ecology and evolution are such fascinating fields is because they, right. they deal with variation. You know, yeah. they don't have these little equations that, you know, this and this adds up to this. They have to look at all this massive variation, figure out where can we, how can we pull signals out of this? That's what makes it all so fascinating. But then to see that just all go out the window and people start claiming these patterns exactly. So I, I really like that you you basically drew that conclusion there. Like we still can't say with much confidence if there's a global signal, even as much as everybody wants to believe it. And I think there is a signal in some places. So like in the Arabian yeah. Sea, there's lower oxygen now. We've seen this huge turnover, which no one's really been talking about of Noctiluca, which is this protozoan sure. that has now become a mixotroph since the year 2000. What? Yes. Wait, wait, I mean, wait. It, like selection has shifted its nutrition sources? It is the crazy, there's no oxygen. I mean, the oxygen in the Arabian Sea has decreased so much that there's these huge low oxygen zones. This protozoan called Noctiluca was always red colored and a heterotroph, meaning it had to eat other things. Mm -hmm. Since 2000, it has created a symbiosis with a proto -euglena. Hundreds of them swim around inside of the Noctiluca now, Whoa. and the Noctiluca are now green colored. They look green. And, and, and the, like the baseline on that is really well established. They were really well studied for decades previous to that shift happening. Totally well studied for decades. They were always red. They were always heterotrophed. Now they are, they brought along their little photosynthesizers with their oxygen tanks, oh for, you know, oxygen making machines. And they have taken over the ecosystem. And the, really the only thing that likes eating them is jellyfish. So, God. so um, we have seen, there are places where there's been shifts. And, yeah. and so, yeah, in those places, you know, things are di different and the jellyfish yeah. are doing really well, but globally, like I said, the globally, the question is really hard to answer. So, yeah, well, I warned you that I wanted this discussion to be 10 hours and you refused. <laughs> you said you only have 45 minutes or so <laughs> an hour. Um, so it forces me to, to cut off. I, there's a hundred other topics. Um, and just scanning through all these names, Ron Larson, I think I was postdoc, uh, postdoc with him at Harbor Branch and we were good buddies. And when I started that shifting baseline stuff, I remember having some talks with him. He was my go-to guy. I we had talked to him several times and said, what's the bottom line? Are these blooms happening worldwide? And he was exactly, she's like, I, you know, there's, there's a lot of some birds, places. Some, place, some places. Yes. Some places. No, exactly. Maybe. Um, what a mess. But um, OK, we're going to bypass a hundred different topics I want to talk about. But let's let's do one little fun thing here. Can you pick up your copy of the book and can you go to the very last paragraph of the whole text that you've written in there right before you start the acknowledgments? And can you slowly read us that last paragraph? And then I want to quiz you about it and talk about life in general and, and what you're getting at with that. That's a great little paragraph you got there to finish it with. So you, you're on the page there and you, you know what we're saying? 
I think so. Okay, so yeah, let's hear it in your own voice. Read that last paragraph. To okay. Us. I realize now that I was wrong when I first swam in the coral reef and believed that biology was immutable, somehow not subject to human whim. We have reached a moment in history when we control the chemistry and biology of our planet. We are that powerful. But we are also endowed with gifts of even greater power. We have the capacity to communicate, to learn quickly, to change course, to create and to recreate, to make decisions for the health of the oceans, to speak up. We can protect this stunning planet we all share if we grow a collective spine, and we can. As a jellyfish scientist told me many years ago, we are an incredible species. That's awesome. Do you still like that paragraph? <laughs> I think I do. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, yeah. That, that clearly is the grand synthesis there and, and your whole theme of spineless and, uh, and all that sort of stuff. And of course, I liked it because you're, you're pointing to communication, how important communication is. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's, of course, your journey that you've gotten into. And and as a matter of fact, you know, you mentioned right at the very beginning about um, as interesting as the work was in Austin with the educational company, you didn't really feel like it was tapping deep into your inner voice and soul and what you wanted to do. Um, and clearly you've, you've managed to get a, a, a chunk of that with this book. Um, and, you know, tell us a few more things about that paragraph. Where did that come from? And wh what were you saying with that? Um, I mean, I, th you know, I think that for a lot, for a lot of times, I think as, as humans, we feel like especially confronted with things as big as climate change and, you know, the lack of, bio, you know, the, the destruction of biodiversity, all these horrible stories that we hear about what we're doing to this planet, you feel really, really powerless. And so I think that recognizing how much power we have, it, it can be sort of a, a, a way to confront that, that sense of powerlessness is to say, look, we're changing the atmosphere. We're changing the chemistry. Like we're doing that so we have the power to do other to do the things also that would protect this planet. And I think that there's something optimistic in that knowledge. Um, you know, the person who said J Jenny Purcell, who said to I me, mean, we are an incredible species, you know, she was saying it in a way that was she was exhausted and tired. And I think there is a way to see it that way. But we can also turn it around almost the way I turned around, like I can't write a book like that. You know, you, you change the inflection and it gives you something to kind of skate on for a little while. And um, I think we all need that right now. Yeah, yeah. Well, speaking of powerful people now, we're going to bring on a powerful addition to our conversation <laughs> here. Uh, Professor Marlis Douglas from University of Arkansas, conservation geneticist. And she is going to grill you with some really tough questions starting. Oh. With, uh, Marlis, you got, you got some thoughts on that paragraph that I had her read there. Wasn't that great? Uh, actually, it's it's a wonderful par paragraph, and it really has brought this podcast full circle. Because when uh, you know, Randy first asked me, so sure, uh, always up for a good conversation, and then he sent me an email a couple of days ago. Did you read Spineless? It's superb. You have to read it. And as soon as he said, "Did you read Spineless?" I thought Randy referred to not in so, such a kind way as he usually does to scientists. <laughs> don't have a spine, <laughs> you know, to get out of their comfort zone and start communicating with broader audiences. So I thought, wow, typical Randy, you know, kind of one of his pet peeves. <laughs> but <laughs> now you just relating your story and this paragraph really has brought it full circle in a way. Yes, you refer to that we can be spineless if you don't dare to get, get up and make our voices heard, but you turn it in a very nice way, you know, that we do have the power that because we're such an amazing species, yes, we have done some bad stuff, but now we also have it in our capacity to do some really great stuff and let's just put together, grow a collective spine. I, I think this is a wonderful paragraph to Stop but but you want to know something? I'm, I'm going to interject something here that involves Marlis, which is um, <clears throat> that we're working right now on a manuscript for publication that we're going to send off in a month or two, um, doing some of our ABT metrics. So the and but therefore breaks down and it turns out very simple little metrics counting the frequency of the word and tells you something about the narrative strength and also the ratio of but to 
to Anne tells you also things about the narrative strength. And so that's our two main metrics is the Anne frequency and the butt to Anne ratio. Um, and we've I've done this for thousands of texts and the patterns are crystal clear and nobody's ever really kind of had the background to dive into that. So it's going to be an interesting paper. But one of the interesting things, there's about seven of us or so are all going to be co-authors on this thing. And early on, Marlis brought up a you know, point and she said, what, what we've done is we've looked at those metrics for three publications, for the New Yorker as a broad publication for uh, a scientific research journal, molecular ecology, and as a narrow research publication, and then reports from one big non-governmental organization. And um, what she pointed out early on was, what about the word however? And my first response was, well, now we're just interested in, in but. And she said, no, I think if you take a look, you'll see scientists use the word however way more than normal. And lo and behold, the data are crystal clear on it. Nobody in the New Yorker uses the word however. We've done 25 articles that we analyzed, and there's only one or two times the word however crops up there. Some of these research articles have got more use of the word however than but. And, and you know, however is a synonym for contradiction, which is the fundamental part of narrative structure. And so that's reflective of the diplomatic nature of scientists. Um, that's a kind way to put it, diplomatic, but it, it's really crucial. And it's diplomacy is very, very essential for our society to, to work. We've seen a president who was completely non-diplomatic. And by the way, that guy used the word but more than any other politician in history. Yeah. And he never, I've been going through his speeches. He never uses the word however. So these are simple little indicators of diplomacy and non-diplomacy at work. Um, and I think that's what scientists, they're stuck with. It is part of their responsibility to be diplomatic in terms of stating their results and not be forthright. And that's the deal you're talking about with the jellyfish blooms, you know, people getting carried away, the desire to want to state things really in simple narrative terms. We've got a clear pattern here when you don't, and it's frustrating, but that word, however, ends up being very reflective of the whole thing. And the other pattern I think that you see within the science world is <clears throat> there's clear patterns from the people down the trenches versus the people up at the top of the hierarchy. And the people in Washington, D.C. at the top of the hierarchy, they're forced into a world where they have to be saying, however, day in and day out, they have to be diplomatic and they have to be restrained and, and they have to be somewhat spineless. You know, I mean, this is, this is an interesting parallel because this is a fun word, spineless and having a spine. But a lot of it's easier said than done. And you get too much spine and you're just, you know, right. Trampling Inflexible. over diplomacy. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. Um, you got some thoughts on all that, Julie? I mean. Uh, I, well, I, I agree that there is a, uh, even in, even in my writing, like I'll, I'll still find myself putting however's in there. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the scientist part of your brain. You know, isn't like it? when I'm yes. doing my like, you know, shitty first draft or whatever, I'll, I'll find those however's and I'm like, oh God, strip those things out, you know, because I know that you don't need the word however, if you're saying things, uh, in a sharp, clear way that you really mean. However, is a however is a thing you can hang some less than crystal thoughts on. And so I think um, you're right. We, we maybe are as scientists kind of just diplomatic people, and yeah. and maybe that's why we something about science is is. I mean, if we wanted to be fighting with each other all the time, we probably would have gone into a different business, you know. Yeah. But, but yeah. But we we don't necessarily that's not our like number one thing we go into science for. I you know, so I think and, and I think in, in in today's world of global problems, and this is what I watched emerge during my science career, was that shift into the need for large scale collaboration. And I think a word like however is a, cr a crucial part of that. You know, you've got to speak diplomatically if you want 18 different investigators to work together on a big project and you're fighting all of these individual egos. Um, it's a simple little I don't know, litmus test or whatever, uh, a, a simple Wait, like that. I just want to make sure, are you advocating for more howevers? Um, not advocating, but I do think it's obligatory um, because, but is it, so for example, I did an ABT workshop with um, 15 people from the state department and they told me from day one, we're told we're never allowed to say the word, use the word, but. Um, oh. Yeah, but it's so powerful. And it's so powerful that Jerry Graff, who's one of the senior statesmen in the whole humanities world, wrote to me a couple of years ago and said, you know, is it not the case that but's probably the most powerful word in the entire English language? If you add up how frequently it gets used and how it, it, it is a word of contradiction that changes the direction of conversation, it's used all day long to structure everything. 
it's very, very powerful. And for reaching the broad audience, that's why you see it in the New Yorker. Um, you know, they use but to because they're trying to reach a big, broad audience. And you see in the front page of the New York Times, they have paragraphs that begin with the word but. It's so powerful. And how are, however is not. But then. But do you think are, however is a little more pretentious? That's a tiny signal in there, but I do think it's more diplomatic. I think that's the key thing. It's softer and it turns the conversation a little bit, but in a, a less abrupt way than just but, 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 but. Um, mm. And that's, I think, what we're picking up on there. And I think there are some of these things in the science world that I've railed against my entire career. And yet, at the same time I rail it, I understand that they have, science has to be anti-innovation and, and conservative in its nature. It can't be running after every new idea that comes up. The frustration of that is when you come up with exciting new ideas, you've got to deal with this system that is built by nature to stay conservative because it's not going to help anybody to end up with a, I mean, even today, you know, as you know, it's a huge problem is the, the amount of noise in the science world. As we're talking about that, that nature paper, the 40% decline, what a giant piece of noise that's there for the rest of eternity. And if you didn't read the rebuttals three months later to put it into context, you end up citing it. So yeah. noise is a huge problem in today's world. And I think as a result, the word, however, is a very important word and it, you can get irked by it, but you got to understand it's got a functionality to it. And the way yeah. you communicate. Um, so you've undergone this transition from the research science world, as I have, to broad communication, and you've seen the changes in language and just your, your first person to mention with your book is not the standard thing so much in the science world. Um, no, no and, and you found it very liberating, I guess, diving into that. Eventually, eventually. At first I was terrified of it, but eventually I did find it really liberating. Yeah, um, yeah. And yeah, but you're, yeah, initially I, I was afraid to, to write in the first person. And you get that pounded out of you as a scientist. This is how we yeah. do it. The investigator did this and did that, exactly. And then the passive voice, you know, and. And yeah. it's just, it's a lot easier to be active when you're writing in the first person, um, yeah. and, and more powerful as a result. Um, Marlis, you got another question there? Yeah, actually, just following up on on this uh, discussion about, however, and uh, scientists having to be sometimes diplomatic and cautious, and you know, as opposed to confidence in your own voice. When you talked earlier about your advisor, you really mentioned that how open-minded he was, you know, and that he tried to see the world through the perspective of others. And I think this made him a really, really good scientist. How important do you think is this open-mindedness, willing to see other perspectives for you as a writer, for anybody as a writer? I think it's, yeah, I think it's critical, right? I mean, you... um you just, your world is enriched. I mean, it's almost like this kind of like, uh, I don't know, psychological biodiversity kind of <laughs> something like that. I, I can't really, I don't know if there's a good descriptor for no, it. That, but... Wait, wait, that that's interesting. Yeah. Is there a term for that? It's, it's psychological biodiversity. <laughs> right. I, know, I know what you're getting Psychodiversity yeah. or something, you know, yeah. like, yeah, like, div- yeah the, the more like sort of diversity of thought in general. diversity right exactly uh yeah. um and i think mm-hmm. it makes yeah it just makes your world a better place to live in when you have perspectives of different people that you can explore um it, it, i feel if you're very rigid then how much fun can it really be to live <laughs> on this planet <laughs> your dignity so, is not much fun um yeah so yeah, and, yeah. Well, and, and, and it's actually, the pleasure of, of reading. You know, you mentioned mm-hmm. earlier that you just really write to the pleasure of reading and kind of getting engulfed in these stories these people build, these worlds. And right. so, yeah, it's it's really very enriching for your yeah. intellectual yeah. life. Um, yeah, and I mean, you you know, I think we, there's a lot of talk in the mainstream media about empathy right now and how we need more empathy, and, and that's all very true. So I think the sense of, openness isn't just important for science or for scientists to be a good scientist. I think it's important for humans to be good humans. But. Um, well, then on, on that note, um, and because we're coming near the end of our time here, uh, tell us about the new book. Oh, yeah. The new book is called Life on the Rocks, 
it's got a really pretty cover. And it's, wait, it's about being an alcoholic? Is that? Yeah, right. I, I talked to, I said to my editor, like, should I make a joke about, you know, whiskey on the rocks in it? There's right. one time, there's one whiskey drink in this book. And yeah. I said, should I put it on the rocks? And she was like, no. <laughs> so like, <laughs> wait, what's what's the subtitle there? Read that book. Um, It is Building a Future for Coral Reefs. So oh, wow. um, this is similarly kind of first person book. Uh, the, the big question is like, what is the future of coral reefs? Um, will they survive the 2050s when 99% of them are supposed to go away? So uh, I go around the wow. world and talk to people who are doing lots of really cool coral reef restoration projects, lots of different ways. Um, did, and did you spend time in the Great Barrier Reef? I was headed to the Great Barrier Reef on March 23rd of 2020. And what happened then? And March the Australian government said, do not come. <laughs> so unfortunately, oh, wow. I had to cover that part of the story from afar. Yeah, yeah. I but um, the book also includes, um, so like Spineless, uh, kind of as, as Randy has said, like it includes the story of this boyfriend I had in grad school and how I was very unspineless in that relationship and <laughs> how I kind of had to learn to grow my own spine, both personally <laughs> and also professionally, um, you know, getting my voice out into the world. And then the story of the jellyfish too. And then this book is about the coral and um, they are literally life that make rocks, but it's also um, at the same time, my daughter who was um, 14 at the time, when I started writing this book, um, started getting very ill with mental illness and um, her world started really collapsing. And there were a lot of parallels I discovered between the coral reefs and mental illness in that um, they're both just critically foundational to everything else. The reefs support a quarter of all marine species and a billion people's primary source of protein. Um, if you're if you don't have mental health you know your friendships fall apart your academics fall apart your job everything you have you know it supports everything so um those two things were intertwined I didn't expect the two stories to come together when I started writing the book but ultimately they did and um ultimately I hope they amplify each other Oh my goodness. I, that's going to be incredibly powerful. Um, yeah. by the way, <clears throat> a little side note on what you were just mentioning there, my experience from, um, from Hollywood and uh, which is I have one of my film school classmates ended up developing major mental health issues. And what you learn in Hollywood is that if you develop um, chemical addiction, drug addiction, things like that, the whole Hollywood community comes together and, and helps you and gets you into rehab. You develop mental health issues. Nobody wants to talk to you. They yeah. just cut you off. They, they you're done with your career. You know that person it's has so money. yeah, it's and so just bad. that, that yes. very point that invisibility of both yeah. mental illness and coral reefs also mm. was another great parallel. I mean, it's really hard for us up here on land to um, to think about what's going on beneath the waves, you know. And yeah. we're terrestrial creatures, <laughs> and yet, um, and same. Like I felt like if my daughter had gotten diabetes or cancer, like people would have been knocking on my door with meals and help. And mm -hmm. with mental illness, it's it's really wow. Our system isn't there to support people as well as it should be. Wow. Um, let's see. I'm gonna ask you a horrible question here. You gave us the jellyfish book, and we had the question of our jellyfish blooms <laughs> getting worse. And you said, I don't know. Um, don't ask this question. Don't ask yes. this question. <laughs> <laughs> Am I going to get the same answer on Coral? I don't know. Right? I, won't, I won't push it on that. Um, no, you can. I okay. have one more well, really well, burning me, question. Yes. Um, hang, hang on one second. Let me say my final word, which was when I was doing the shifting baseline stuff. I mean, my big thing I rail against the whole environmental world is there's no, just no leadership. There's no singular voice. And it's so hard to get a signal on these things, a clear signal of where are we going? Is it getting better or getting worse and things like that? And all these different groups are all competing against each other. There's just no leadership. So it all drove me crazy, uh, ultimately, the environmental movement. But um, let's see, Marlis, you have a question to ask. Sure. And I kind of maybe this also helps some with mental illness for some people. But you related, you know, that you were a science person, a nerdy person. And then you dared, you, you used this defeat of being not considered famous enough to write for somebody more famous, but you use it as, a, as an opportunity to find your own voice as a writer. So for 
people who listen to this podcast, scientists who thought maybe about making their voices heard, what recommendations would you give them? Do they have to seek additional training? How should they get started? Just any advice you can give them probably would be very, very helpful. Yeah. So uh, you, the main thing I can say is practice writing. Practice. And I think if you can have accountability, that makes it even better. So I put together a writing group um, and we met every Monday and we would, every, you know, one, there were five of us in the group. Each time someone would have to submit something, we would all read it, comment on it, but in a supportive way, not in a mean way, you know, right. and, <laughs> and, um, and that accountability every five weeks, having to turn something in practicing writing, getting feedback. I mean, that is really the way to get a free MFA. So, um, you know, other people reading your writing, being brave enough to give it to other people, being brave, brave enough to comment on other people's writing, you learn a lot from that. And then having that like discipline of, yes, every five weeks, I'm going to write a article or whatever you want to write, you know, the thing and that you have to turn in. Um, and that's very interesting because that's one of the core principles of our ABT training, which is the the social dynamic. You can't do this stuff by yourself at your desk alone, writing your thing. You may think you've written something brilliant, but you've got to have those other brains to bounce it off of. And in fact, the model we've converged on now, our narrative gym, the session we did yesterday, we had uh, about 22 or 23 builders in there. And so that's 23 brains that are listening to your narrative in which you thought you had airtight and then all the <laughs> suggestions start coming in like, oh my God, didn't think about that. Didn't think about that. You got to get that diversity of brains listening to your, your stuff to realize that, yeah, you, you really, I mean, that's, that principle is age old in Hollywood, the writer's room, basically, and writer's yeah. groups sort of stuff. And that's a lot of what we're basically doing with what we do. Um, Jiminy Christmas, as I said, we could go on for nine more hours, but <laughs> our hour is up. And Marlis, if you got one last super short question for Julie? No, no actually, <laughs> no. I, I mean, yeah, yeah, I would like to talk nine more hours to Julie, but uh, <laughs> I think this has, it has been wonderful to meet you, Julie, hear a woman's voice who dared to become a writer, a confident voice. And I think this is very inspiring for a lot of young people, young scientists, but especially women as well. And I, I love, you know, the little anecdote Randy related that, oh, it's me who tells the story. So I can, I can pick the story I want. And that's uh, very empowering. Thank you so much. I, got, that, I told you that gave me whiplash. I'm sitting there reading along and all of a sudden you say, there's a lot of different ways this can be told, but I'm the writer here. I'm telling it my way. He raped her. <laughs> that was awesome. I know. Um, <laughs> well done. Uh, cool. All right. Well, yeah, we can't wait to read uh, the second book, which sounds like it's going to be very, very powerful, but as it needs to be. And that's what's needed. And it, it's exactly what you're doing is you're you're bringing in bravely, bravely bringing in the human dimension to it. That's that's the thing that I was pointing out there with the comparison to Henrietta Lacks. You know, it's just people don't understand. It takes a certain element of courage to open yourself up and tell your own personal story as you did in the first book. And clearly you're taking it to a deeper depth of the second one. And that's how we communicate most effectively is that first person experience. I lived this, I did this. Um, so that is tremendous. And on that note, thank you very much for taking the time to join us. And uh, we'll have you back again someday and we can go in much deeper in invertebrate zoology tales because I can <laughs> talk that endlessly. And next time we'll have Diana Padilla join us because she was in all the invert courses with me way back there. You, we didn't even get around talking about Kozlov. She, yeah, we've got to get you back to talk hardcore inverts um any day i love that that's my favorite <laughs> it goes, it goes on and on excellent all right thank you very right, much and you, that will do us for thank episode you. 43 here and uh, we will talk to you all again sometime soon so thanks bye-bye